In the Zone, presented by TD. It's another edition of In the Zone presented by TD, Ben Ennis, and Mike Wilner. And sorry that I look like kind of a jerk because I'm wearing sunglasses, but the roof is open down here at Rogers Center, Mike, and I, I have to wear the sunglasses. I know it's Bob McCowan's move, but I, it's not trademarked, is it? I'm not wearing sunglasses, and I'm looking into exactly the same stuff that you are. It, it is a jerk move, I have to tell you. But it's my fault that the jerk move is happening because I'm down here later than usual because of coaching my grade four and fives to a, a city softball championship. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Uh, you're, you look dry, so you, you didn't get the Gatorade shower, it looks like. They knew I had to come to work. <laughs> That's smart. Smart move by them. Uh, we're also talking to, you know, one of the leading journalists, obviously, in, in baseball, Bob Woodward over here. This, uh, well, we're taping this on a Tuesday uh, evening before game two of this three-game set with the Washington Nationals. And, Mike, on Twitter, you were the first to break the Vladimir Guerrero news that he would not, in fact, be a Blue Jay at any point. Yeah, there were some rumors floating around. And when there are rumors floating around, I talk to people who you know, are actually involved in the situation and know what's going on. And, and I have a, a good source who told me that Vladdy packed his stuff and left after the game yesterday. And so I went on, uh, and, and amazingly, the reaction to that was just two hours of, oh, you're full of crap and all this stuff. And, and that's what wound up happening. Guerrero asked for his release, or at least the Blue Jays are being nice about the way they're putting it. Vladdy left the team, and he said, if you're not calling me up today, then then release me and Alex Anthopoulos's reaction as always to any ultimatum is all right see ya and and that's you know that's what happened and that's fine with me you know what Vladdy had really no right to expect a call up he tore it up in a ball he was like three for 16 in triple a and then he got hit on a hand and had to miss a few days and so I think the Blue Jays are well within their rights to say, well, let's see how you rebound. One game's not enough. He had a big game last night with four hits, but that's not enough. Show us you're ready. And then there has to be room for him. And there doesn't seem to be room for him right now because there's not a chance he's playing any left field. So um, it was the right thing to do. I'm sure that Anthopolis never guaranteed him X date will call you up by, na by this point in time. And that, that's what happens. I'm a little upset about it because I was looking forward to the, the hacktastic uh, wonder that is Vladimir Guerrero. He's just, he is, I, it, during his prime, he was one of the more exciting players in Major League Baseball. That was awesome. His strike zone is from his forehead to his ankles. He has hit a, a the, the legend is that he hit a home run on a ball that bounced in Detroit. So, yeah, I was looking forward to seeing that too, but only if he can actually produce and be a middle of the order uh, productive bat for them. And there's, you know, you look at what he did last year in Baltimore. It would have been really, really exciting to have him here. No question about that. But is he still Vladimir Guerrero? Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, the Blue Jays have been pretty lucky as far as the injuries are concerned this season. I would say Sergio Santos, obviously, was the biggest injury that they've suffered. But it looks like maybe a little bit of bad news with Brandon Morrow as he did something. I guess they're calling it an oblique strain right now, right which here. is... That was not necessary Podcast, to do. Right there. <laughs> it's right That's there. It okay. Uh, so he left the game. It uh, looked pretty serious. Uh, when John Farrell got the news in the, in the dugout, it looked like it, it was going to be a, a career-threatening or something because he did not look impressed when he got the news from Hap Hudson, the, uh, the Blue Jays trainer. But, I mean, if it's an oblique, uh, that's almost, to me, one of the better-case scenarios. It isn't. It isn't. I mean, I, I think with, with an elbow... Yeah, you're going to miss a ton of time with a shoulder. You could miss years, it's true. And uh, if you pull a hamstring, you know it's going to be X number of time. With an oblique, you don't necessarily know. And there's so much torque in every pitcher's motion, not necessarily especially his, but he's got a lot of, of moving parts there. And there's a lot of stress on this side of the body as you open up to make that pitch. So I can see it being easily four to six weeks at the least, but maybe not. Maybe it's only two. It's very, very difficult for me to believe that he doesn't go on the disabled list. I think chances are we're going to see in the next 24 to 48 hours. They'll put him on the DL. Jesse Chavez or maybe Brett Cecil, but probably Jesse Chavez will come up and make that start on Sunday. What do you think of Bryce Harper? How can you not be impressed? You know, three for four with a walk, steals a base, scores a run, um, made played center field for a few innings and, and looked fine. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more. But how can you not be impressed by that first game? No, I was impressed, and I was impressed uh, by 
what he had to say as well. We got a chance to catch up with Bryce Harper before game two of this three-game set against the Washington Nationals. Here with Bryce Harper and Bryce, we got to talk about game one of this series against the Blue Jays. That little, I don't even want to call it collision at third base with uh, Brett Laurie, but uh, of course both of you highly touted uh, younger players uh, in uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, I mean, guys both big kids as well. Uh, what did you make of that collision at third base? Nothing really. You know, he, uh, it was just I had nowhere to go. You know, I was trying to avoid it as much as I could. You know, Tisa made a great throw. He made a great play. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, something that happened. And, uh, you know, there was nothing to it, to it at all. So, number of young players that are making waves around Major League Baseball right now. Yourself, Mike Trout, and Brett Lowry, of course. Do you have communication with those guys at all? Do you feel almost like a, a, a brotherhood between you, or is it just you know just your teammates and you don't even think about the guys that are around your age and performing well in the major leagues? Uh, you know, Lowry, he's a great player. You know, he picks the you know picks the heck out of it at third base. You know, with the best of him, you know, he can swing it. He plays the game the right way. He plays it hard, and uh, you know he has that fire and that you know mentality that uh, you know he wants to win every single game. Wants to play hard every day, and you know that's what you're going to get out of him. Trout, you know, he's the same way. Trout's an unbelievable player. You know, hitting 360 with seven and. You know, something like that. So, uh, you know, he, he's an unbelievable ball player. You know, got to know him in the AFL this past year, and, you know, we became pretty good friends. Same man, Will Middlebrook. So, uh, you know, they're two great guys, and, uh, you know, it's fun to, you know, look around and see how guys are doing, and, uh, you know, just wish them all the best. So, You guys have a beautiful ballpark there in D.C., beautiful grass. You come here and uh, under the dome when uh, the weather's not right. Hopefully we'll get a dome open here for game two, but also the turf and uh, three hits in the opener of this three-game set. One of them... Uh, bouncer up the middle and maybe aided a little bit by the turf. How many times have you ever played on turf like this before? Um, I haven't. You know, it's the first time playing on turf, so uh, you know it's a little different. Um, you know, sometimes you get you know a little uh, a little aggressive on it because you know you feel a little bit faster. Or, you know, feel like you know the, the ball you know when it hits it you know the ground and whatnot. You can take that extra bag and you know, things like that. So uh, you know it's a lot of fun playing on a different uh, you know, different set of turf and uh, you know different not grass, but. Uh, you know, it's a lot of fun and, uh, you know, a little, little different and, you know, it's just uh, got to adjust to it sometimes. So. Do you feel like as a defender maybe you have to play things differently, maybe hang back on balls that you're not sure you're going to get to because you don't want them to bounce over your head? Is it, is it a different mindset when you're playing in the outfield? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, uh, you know, Batista hits a ground ball to me, you know, it's going to be, you know, coming at me pretty hard. So, you know, a little bit harder than it is on grass and, uh, you know, same thing with all your guys, you know. If, you hit a ball and, you know, it's hopping and, you know, jumping around. I think, uh, you know, it's a little tough. Lowry made a great play on a uh, short hop yesterday that, uh, you know, it was pretty pretty impressive, I thought, you know, coming through it and whatnot and, you know, big hop and, you know, made a great play. So, uh, you know, you just got to play with, uh, you know, got to play with it a little bit and, you know, just try to adapt to it as, as best as you can in three-game set. So. What little we've seen from you in Major League Baseball, we know you have a great arm. Uh, Jose Bautista has one of the better arms in Major League Baseball as well, and you were thrown out by him in game one of the of the uh, three game set. Do you look at guys like that as a, you know, almost a fraternity as well, guys with great arms in the outfield and Rick Ankeel. Where do you rank those guys as far as the best arms in Major League Baseball? Maybe take yourself out of the equation, Rick, Jose Bautista, some guys great in the past. Um, uh, Raul Mondesi, one of the best arms in the outfield. Do you look at guys like that for inspiration when you're playing defense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Jeff Francois has got a cannon also. You know, there's some, there's some guys in this league that you can absolutely throw the ball and throw it straight and throw it, you know, to, to the bag. And Ichiro, Hamilton, you know, there's some guys that, uh, you know, just have impressive arms. So, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, take that extra bag on some guys. And, you know, sometimes they get you, sometimes they don't. And, uh, you know, yesterday Batista got me. So you just got to tip your cap. You know, he's an all-star and, you know, throws the crap out of it from right field. And, you know, same, same thing with Ankiel. You know, Ankiel has an absolute cannon also. And, you know, it's fun to watch. So even, you know, if you get thrown out, it's fun to watch. So it's good. Thanks for this, Bryce. There's Bryce Harper, outfielder for the Washington Nationals. And hopefully I'll be able to look back on that interview in 20 years and say, that was that kid's first year in the major leagues, and now he's going to the Hall of Fame. Certainly appears to be on that upward trajectory as there's Mike Wilner's arm as well. Uh, one of the greatest Blue Jays of all time, Carlos Delgado, in town as well. Brought a bunch of Puerto Rican students to check out Toronto and see the, the city and catch a, a Blue Jays game as well. And I got to catch up with Carlos and his memories of being a Blue Jay. Here with one of the greatest Blue Jays of all time, Carlos Delgado. And, and Carlos, uh, I know you haven't returned a lot since uh, you retired from Major League Baseball. What does it feel like to, to be back here where you spent so much of your career? This, this is a great feeling. I landed yesterday and I already felt the love. So uh, I didn't realize it was so long. It's been six years since I've been back. 
but uh, it was nice. We came to the stadium this morning with a group of kids that we were with, and uh, you know, there's some good memories. And now that you can come out and watch batting practice, it's it's, it's awesome. This city was. Uh, very good to me. I was here for 11 years. I had some great memories. Uh, always very fond of the Blue Jays. They gave me opportunity to break into the big leagues and establish myself, so I will always remember that. Yeah, let's talk about some of the memories that you have of this building, and there's so many. I mean, the one that stands out for most people is the four-homer game. Is that, for you, the highlight of your career? Yeah, it has to be up there. I always remember opening day in 1994 because it was my first opening day in uh, in the big leagues. My mom and dad were here. It was a big thrill for me. Uh, we had some good friends here, like 97, 98, 2000. We had some great teams here. I mean, we came up a little short, but uh, I-, I will always remember those uh, days. Let's talk about uh, Puerto Rico a little bit. And uh, the first overall pick in the draft, Houston Astros, Correa. He's a kid from Puerto Rico. D- do you know him at all? Uh, have you gotten a chance to see him play? I'm, I met him uh, a few times. And actually, I've seen him play uh, a couple of times. He's very good, very talented. Uh, he's got, like, all the tools. he got strong arm, good good, good hands, especially for a guy that is 6'4", play shortstop. So uh, I think he's going to be uh, he's gonna be all right. He's, uh, they say his work ethics unbelievable he works harder than anybody else and that will definitely make a difference so well i wish definitely wish him the best yeah six four guy not a lot of six four shortstops you think he'll be able to stick at shortstop well we don't know as of right now i mean he's 17 i guess eventually he probably going to fill up a little bit more but uh, i think he's athletic enough so we'll we'll see I mean, yeah, you talk about position changes. You came up as a catcher, right? No, so I'm no, no kidding. I move around a little bit. Catcher, <laughs> left field, DH, ended up at first base. It wasn't such a bad thing, though. Look at the stadium and how much it has changed. I mean, not, I mean, the city's changed so much in just six years as well, the last time you were here. Yeah. But, I mean, the field turf on the ground here, just the, the, the ribbon boards as well, and just the type of team. I mean, what is the biggest change that you've noticed since you were last here? Uh, well... The city itself has just changed. The skyline is definitely different. I can't, uh, I can't get over the turf. You know, I wish I had it. I probably would have uh, prolonged my career a little bit. But uh, I think the the, the team, uh, the complexion of the team changed a little bit. They're definitely going younger. They they have a very talented ball club. You know, we don't get to see all the games in Puerto Rico, but you know, you follow. So they, they got some guys that can actually, you know, they can hit the ball. You got, I think you got better pitching now that what you that in the days that I that I was here. So uh, I mean, you're still in the American League East, uh, so you got you got a good challenge there. But I think once the players, you know, they get a little older, they mature a little bit. They're gonna they're gonna embrace that challenge, and it's gonna be interesting. Yeah, certainly will. Thanks a lot for this, Carlos. My pleasure. Thank you. There's Carlos Delgado, and yes, didn't lead this team to a championship, didn't even lead him to a playoff berth, but he played in 94, year after the World Series, uh, and they obviously was no World Series in 1994. Uh, they weren't going to make it, though, anyways, but, I mean, Mike, this guy, Hall of Fame is a question, but certainly belongs on the level of excellence here at Rogers Center. Oh, there's no question about it, and, and while you're showing all the lovely people that fine interview you did, and that was spectacular, by the way, with Carlos Delgado. You're welcome. I was looking up at the level of excellence just to see if there was kind of a, a spot that might have been brushed over so they can yank a thing off and give it to Carlos Delgado. There's no question he goes up there. You can make the argument that he's the best player they've ever had, and yes, he didn't play in the World Series years, and he's probably not going into the Hall of Fame, but Roberto Alomar is. And Delgado's a homegrown guy. He was here for the better part of a decade. He leads this team in everything, and he was the uh, the first, the only really huge big-time slugger this team has ever, ever had. That high on base, high slugging, high batting average. Should have been an MVP once, maybe even twice. Uh, Delgado, Alomar, Roy Halladay, and Dave Steve are the four best Blue Jays, and you could probably put them in any order depending on the day or the week. So there's absolutely a spot for him on this level of excellence, and he deserves to be celebrated here. So does this podcast, and uh, maybe one day it'll end up on the level of excellence as well. That'd be great. That would be tremendous. Mike, thanks for this, buddy. The podcast of excellence. Yes, the podcast of excellence. He's Mike Wilner. Follow him on Twitter at Wilnerness590. I'm Ben Ennis. You can follow me at Snet, And hopefully we'll put up a graphic here with that spelling because there's a couple S's there, and it's a little confusing. But that's been another edition of In the Zone presented by TD. We'll see you again next week.